Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a meeting, the title, From Student Revolt to Workers' Power, Strategies to Defeat U.S. Imperialism and Free Palestine. Um, before we get started, I just want to go ahead and thank uh, the Migrant Justice Center for providing this space for us to be holding this meeting. Um, and I also just want to say for anyone that's interested, um, there is currently a campaign going on right now uh, for an apartheid free community. Uh, this is a call for unions and any organizations to sign on to a pledge declaring that uh, this community, that Burlington is apartheid free and opposes any type of cooperation or ties to the Israeli apartheid state. So if you're involved in and whether it's your union or any organization, we encourage you to do some organizing uh, within that group and, and get them to join the campaign because it's really exciting stuff going on right now. Um, so for this talk tonight, um, we are thrilled to have Helen Scott as our speaker this evening. Yep, she is, um, she is a professor at UVM. She's a member of the Tempest Collective, which is sponsoring uh, this event this evening. And she will be talking to us about um, the encampments that have taken place, the inspiration there, and also where we go from here and how we exert the real power um, that's going to be necessary in order to bring about real change. So thanks, Helen. You can go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm gonna begin with some quotes from the press uh, from this past week. Uh, the, first, the first article is uh, from the New York Times. It's called, From Free Speech to Free Palestine, Six Decades of Student Protest. When did you ever think you would hear that? <laughs> In the New York Times. The protests against Israel's war in Gaza that have erupted on college campuses around the United States are merely the latest in a tradition of student-led, left-leaning activism dating back at least to the civil rights and anti-Vietnam War protests of the 1960s. Second one is from The Guardian, the London newspaper, and it's called, There Are People in Tents Writing Dissertations. Hala Hamina, a Palestinian who has been involved in protests at the University of Newcastle, said more than 400 people she knows in Gaza have been killed. Hamina, 31, who came to the UK before October said, I don't have friends now. They have all either been killed or lost their families. I'm doing this for all of Gaza that's facing a genocide, something that's unprecedented and unimaginable. I must do whatever is possible to be done and even impossible We'll make it possible. It's so important for the student community and British community that they are fighting for justice. And the last one is from the Wall Street Journal. <coughs> and it's called um, College Protests, Faculty Free Speech. Faculty, many of whom are in their 60s and 70s and came of age during the era of Vietnam War protests, are pushing back against university presidents, accusing the leaders of heavy-handed and inconsistent crackdowns on free speech, and warning against a wave of authoritarianism some say has been creeping onto campuses for years. Professors in leadership positions are guiding calls for votes of no confidence, spearheading classroom war counts, and visiting encampments alongside students. Many are facing punishment from police and their employers. Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> so I think this coverage captures the central dynamics of this stage of the struggle. Um, students' deep emotional pain and anger and moral outrage in response to Israel's continuing genocide and ethnic cleansing. The mass shift to civil disobedience and the brutal crackdown from university and city authorities, which has repeatedly led to renewed struggle, including extraordinary solidarity from faculty, the spread of university protests across the nation and the globe. Uh, for example, the new school faculty have now set up their own encampment. That's incredible. Named for the Palestinian teacher and poet, Rafat al who was murdered uh, by Israel earlier this year and whose eldest daughter and 
baby grandchild uh, were just murdered by Israel last month. So we've all been watching the stunning scenes from Columbia, from NYU, from USC, and across the country and the world. And in the last almost two weeks, not quite two weeks, we've seen this take hold in Vermont with student encampments in Middlebury, in Sterling, and at UVM, provoking a huge outpouring of support from the community. And as many have said, students have become the conscience of the nation refusing to accept the normalization of genocide. And in turn, they have revitalized the broader movement in solidarity with Palestine. So after seven months of Israel's genocidal assault, following, of course, 75 years of Palestinian dispossession, illegal occupation, and the apartheid system, Solidarity with Palestine has grown dramatically. Our movement has been protesting and agitating for a ceasefire constantly for seven months now, but without having a visible impact. The Israel's war on Gaza continues. Even after the International Court of Justice confirmed South Africa's charge that Israel's commi committing genocide, the Biden administration went ahead and rewarded Israel with $26 billion extra funding and munitions. But even while nothing seemingly changes in terms of the continuation of the war, Palestinian liberation can no longer be stifled and suppressed. It has burst down into every area of life. And in some ways, everything has changed. Mm -hmm. And the student revolt has revitalized the movement, which was starting to flag after seven months. And it has expanded the demands from ceasefire to boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Exactly. So these, the student encampments and the student uh, direct action have been met in most cases by the armed might of the police wielded by both uni university administration and cities. Republican far-right forces have been leading a campaign against wo wo wokeism, as they call it, for years, um, targeting trans rights and any critical investigation of systemic racism or systemic inequality in schools and universities. These opponents of what they called cancel culture are, are happy now to cancel anyone who dares to criticize Israel. And of course, we are not for cancel culture. We, we support freedom of speech, but the First Amendment protects political speech. It doesn't protect acts of genocide. Mm -hmm. So we are for canceling war criminals, mm -hmm. just to clarify the difference. These same right-wing forces are some of the most vocal enemies of the campus protests now leading the new McCarthyism, which criminalizes and punishes any advocacy for Palestinians. But the attack on Palestine organizing now is fully bipartisan. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the worst crackdowns have been ordered by liberal administrations, often women and people of color, and approved by Democratic Party mayors. Mm -hmm. Biden has explicitly supported the criminalization of dissent. His speeches have, if you've watched them, if you can bear to stomach to watch them, have falsely portrayed the student protests as violent and anti-Semitic, lawless and anti-Semitic. And others, of course, have added to these two charges the, la the other threat of outside agitators. They're led by outside agitators. So let's just get rid of these false allegations for a moment. One, the encampments have been uniformly peaceful. The only violence has come from the provocateurs, which there have been some, and mostly from the police. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the protesters are not anti-Semitic. They are anti-Zionist. And many of the protesters are themselves Jewish. And third, students have organized them themselves. <laughs> 
Any outside forces are there for solidarity, not as, not as uninvited agitators. So while there are, as I said, Zionist and fascist provocateurs attacking encampments, liberals have given them a free pass while presiding over mass arrests of the students and faculty protesting genocide. Mm -hmm. And this is because US support for Israel is itself bipartisan. Mm -hmm. The two nations are deeply connected, as we know. US imperialism relies on Israel as its watchdog in the Middle East. Israel relies on the US to provide all of the military funding which it needs. This special relationship explains why academic and political establishment both are largely unified behind the use of brute violence and vicious slander to crush, the, to crush this movement. You know, wildly disproportionate violence and slander for what is effectively a standard peaceful student protest mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. We've all seen the viral videos of peaceful students beaten and dragged away by riot cops. Um, we've seen the viral video of Annalise Orlek, the 65-year-old Jewish Dartmouth history professor, former head of, the Ju of Jewish studies, knocked to the ground and arrested. Um, in an interview, Orlek says, those cops were brutal to me. I promise I did absolutely nothing wrong. I was standing with a line of women faculty in their 60s to 80s trying to protect our students. I have now been banned from the campus where I have taught for 34 years. She also wrote that the cops tried to hurt me, they did hurt me, and they seemed to enjoy it. Or the chair of philosophy at Emory, Noelle McAfee, being led away by the police while she calls asking someone to, to inform her office that she's been arrested. <laughs> she said that the uh, the, the Atlanta PD had been told to clear the campus just hours after it had been set up. She said, they were also clearly, they were also clearing anybody who was right there. Students are just being pummeled. And so I go walking a few steps over and then I see this child on the ground, a 20 year old being pummeled by the police. There's like two of them pulling and pushing. Her head is on the ground as she's curled up in a ball, trying to put her arms over her head to keep them off of her. So I'm standing back six feet, holding my camera at them, and I start yelling, stop, stop. And that's when she was arrested. God. So these, these protests and these scenes of protests and the scenes of the crackdown have drawn wide support for the, from the mass movements they're connected to. Black Lives Matter, police abolitionism, Stop Cop City. Um, these, these, these groups are standing in solidarity, seeing in this crackdown on the protest, the same pattern of you know, police, police brutality and injustice that has been meted out to um, black people in this, in this country and other oppressed groups. The, the generalization of disproportionate violence to include those such as senior academics at elite universities who would have previously been unlikely to fall foul of police brutality mm -hmm. has only broadened the support for the movement. Mm -hmm. New encampments have shot up to replace those that, have, uh, that, that were raised. Faculty have organized human chains around encampments to protect their students. Now, um, and all of this support, despite the fact that they've been pretty uniformly vilified in the mainstream press. Right. So at this point, some of the campuses, on some of the campuses, encampments continue. Others have been already forcibly erase, raised by the state. Um, others have strategically dismantled themselves as at UVM in order for students to continue the struggle in other ways. So it's like a strategic decision. We'll, we'll do this now so that we can come back and fight another day. So, but some, some are continuing. In some cases, there have been significant victories, such as Trinity College Dublin, Dublin <laughs> which um, agreed to divest from Israel. <coughs> and at UVM, 
just over a week of encampment won two pretty important victories. You know, one UVM administration committing to financial disclosure, and then most magnificently, the cancellation of Ambassador Thomas Greenfield as commencement speaker. Whatever the specific story of the encampments themselves, the upsurge in student struggle has given the global solidarity movement hope and inspiration from the West Bank to Burlington, Vermont. Now the movement faces two major questions. The first is how to sustain and build mass support and expand our demands. And this, as we know, is going to be a long struggle. As we watch the brutal attack on Rafa, it is obvious that Israel is determined to continue with its genocide and ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. um, and continue its illegal occupations and apartheid regime. And our government continues to lend unconditional support. <coughs> this indelible bond between Israel's settler colonialism and US imperialism will not easily be broken. So we have to figure out what kinds of strategies will allow us to hold strong, increase our reach, and keep moving forward. Opening up democratic spaces so that widening layers of people can take ownership of the movement. Engaging in building campaigns like the Apartheid Free Communities campaign. And ultimately, building boycott, divestment, and sanctions on Israel, which is the way to challenge that power at the root. Mm -hmm. The second question is to do with social power itself. The student encampments have successfully regalvanized the movement, and, and they've also drawn renewed attention to Palestine. It's back in the news in a major way, in, you know, at, a, at a time when it was kind of dropping out. <coughs> Students have significant power to ignite and expand movements, and we're seeing that. But students alone have limited power to actually change the course of institutions. Yes, in some cases, universities have made concessions, but even the most, even the most big, you know, sizable and militant encampments have not actually jeopardized any institution. Mm -hmm. Um, or actually done more than temporarily disrupt business as usual. The force that does have the power to paralyze universities and other workplaces is labor, the power of workers. By withholding labor, workers uh, can, act can actually stop business as usual. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so significant that the US labor movement is making unprecedented moves towards Palestine solidarity. We've seen countless calls for ceasefire, resolutions against genocide, statements of solidarity with the student protesters um, from union locals and internationals all over the country, which again is very new. We're actually seeing changes in the labor movement itself. Um, and, and these are kind of organic developments that are M that are seeing the merging of student and labor struggles. The UAW is unionizing more student workers while democratizing its own structures. Mm -hmm. um, its rank and file pressure from below have led Sean Fain to take the kind of public stances that he's taken. So that's, that's an um, indicative of this kind of merger that's happening between student and, and labor struggles. It's also important to stress that, that many students are themselves workers. Um, student workers are at the forefront of many organizing drives um, and of social justice unionism. Here at UVM, Palestine Solidarity is bringing together staff, faculty, um, and, and graduate student unions for the first time, and in new ways. Um, including in the new but vibrant Labour for Palestine group, which is bringing together union members from all over the state. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk more about that in discussion. Everybody can bring in different examples. But one of the most exciting developments that I wanted to name is um, UAW 4811 at the University of Cal Cal California. 
um, they filed an unfair, sorry, unfair labor practice over changes to campus speech policy at UCLA. So there is a strike authorization vote on the 13th of this month, and this is this is impacting 48,000 workers mm -hmm. in the un in the UC system, which is huge. It's like epoch-changing stuff. But this merging, the merging of the student movement with the labor movement r can reinvigorate both. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the labor movement provides the social power to the student movement. And this can bring us closer to the goals of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which again, is the, the bread and butter one thing making this easier is that campuses are more unionized than ever mm -hmm. and many students are now in unions which puts them in touch with other workers so again it's this kind of organic flow also today's radicals are inclined to be more pro-labor this is a kind of instinctive feeling for people who are on the side of social justice that unions are a good thing that labor is important more people are seeing the interconnections between global capitalism, systemic racism, and oppression around gender and sexuality. These things are all connected. And this May Day really showed that, mm -hmm. again, across the country, students and workers showing how to unite in demonstrations. Uh, I want to uh, end really with, with the example that's quite close to, hold, close to home, um, of Dartmouth, mm -hmm. where Gold UE, the graduates, Graduate Workers Union, is on strike. Mm -hmm. um, I just got a report from a former UVM professor, comrade, and Tempest Collective member, Nancy Welsh, who's doing solidarity work there. Uh, she lives in, in Hanover now, and she's in, she's in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And this is, this is her description of what's going on there. At Monday's general, model, general meeting, gold members voted to support the demands of disclose, divest, and drop the arrests. They are scheduled to take up at next Monday's meeting the question of making these demands a condition for ending their strike. The grad students on the picket line and the PSC undergraduates who are now holding nine till nine teach-ins on the Baker lawn or the lobby of Baker Library are being fed three meals a day, Monday to Wednesday, by the strike kitchen, <laughs> organized by DSA, but with many students and community members participating. Faculty haven't turned up for kitchen shifts, but have signed up to send <laughs> restaurant meals to the pickets. <laughs> The strike kitchen <laughs> dinners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the strike kitchen dinners have become an organizing space for gold and PSC to collaborate and work together. So this is a, you know, it's a beautiful example of this convergence of union, student, and community struggle. And it's a model of the way forward for our movement. Palestine is the epicenter of a radical convergence of movements. It's, and, and it's a movement that's more resistant to co-optation than many others in the past yeah. because Israel is so fundamental to US imperialism right. and to global capitalism. Then that's, their side is not going to give up. And so our side is forced to continue to struggle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> As the highly political strike at Dartmouth that I just described shows, the political and the economic are not separate, mm -hmm. and they're not separable, but rather they're connected and build on, e build on each other. So through Palestine solidarity, the merger of student and worker movements has the revolutionary potential to challenge the entire capitalist system, which is not something that we see every day so <laughs> <laughs> it's a special moment and let's talk more about specific examples of these um, these different developments in discussion 